Okay, this morning we're going to continue in the book of Luke. Turn with me, please, to chapter 15 of Luke. And we're going to read two verses that we had read last week, um, verse 1 and 2. Verse 1, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Okay. Notice right there again, here is Jesus. Okay. He has come to walk in our midst, and Jesus the man, also the Son of God, he is manifesting the grace of God, not condemnation and not judgment. And so look at what happens, right? look at the reactions. The tax collectors and the sinners all drew near to him. Those who need grace are drawn near to Jesus. They naturally come because they see in him. I don't know if they know this or not, but somewhere deep down inside, I think they understand they are not right with God. And when they see Jesus manifesting the very nature of God, you would think that a sinner would be afraid to come to the Lord. But in people in need of grace are going to be naturally drawn to Jesus. And so he, like we said last week, he attracts those unsavory elements of society that people don't want to be associated with because these are the people who need him. Now notice verse 2, the other reaction on the other spe- end of the spectrum. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Right? Those people who deem themselves to be righteous, we looked at this last week, those who think themselves righteous, they will look down on others who outwardly may seem more contemptible. But if you think about it, in their pureness of heart, these sinners, these tax collectors, these adulterers, these prostitutes, in the pureness of their heart, right? And you think I might be reading my notes wrong? How how can these sinners be pure of heart? But look at their reaction when they see Jesus. It was in pureness of heart that they realized, I need what he has, and they come, right? But here, the Pharisees and scribes, they look at these other elements of society and look down on them, and not only are they repulsed by these people, the sinners, but who else are they repulsed by? Jesus himself, right? Now, are the Pharisees and scribes sinners also? Yes, very much so, we know this. All of us are sinners. They all need Jesus as well, but they themselves, they don't see that their hearts, there's something worse in their hearts than the sinners and tax collectors. Because when they see Jesus, instead of responding to his grace, they are not only repulsed by the other people, the other sinners, they are also repulsed by Jesus. And that is a very sad state to be in. So Jesus knows their heart, and so he goes on to respond to them. Not directly, but he tells three parables. And last week, we examined the first of these three parables, and we came to see that when we look at the parable of the lost sheep, we need to come to realize all of us are that lost sheep. All of us, every single one of us, because we are sinners, we are that lost sheep. And Jesus, in his tenderness, he came to seek out each and every one of us. None of us are better than any others. None of us have been able to save ourselves by any means. And on the flip side of that, there is none that are lost who are without hope. Because Jesus came to seek everyone who is lost. So there is nobody who is so lost that they should ever think, I'm done, there is no hope for me. There is always hope because Jesus is always seeking. And notice, it wasn't anything that the sheep did to return to the fold, right? That the, the stupid sheep was out there, lost on his own in the wilderness. He didn't know to come back, and even if he wanted to come back, he wouldn't know how to come back. It was the good shepherd who went, who went and found him, picked him up, carried him on his shoulders and brought him back. It's all what Jesus did, not anything that we have done to bring ourselves back to the fold. And so we see in the first parable the amazing grace that Jesus has brought to humanity. That all of us have hope and all of us, when he finds us, if we respond to him, we can be brought back to the fold. Now, let's go on. We're going to look at the second parable today. So we're going to read together verses 8 through 10 in Luke chapter 15. If you're there, read with me. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, 
sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. First of all, there are some differences between this parable and the first. Or what woman having ten silver coins if she loses one coin? First of all, what was lost in this parable is a coin, not sheep, right? Sheep are dumb animals. They are living just for the moment. They're the sheep that is lost in wilderness, it represents the souls that are lost in the world that needs to be brought back to salvation. People or sheep, or I guess you can call them sheeple, they're, they're living life just day to day, just for the sake of surviving. Right? Many people, that's how they live. I just need to work so I can get that next paycheck, so I can pay rent and put food in my fridge and on the table and pay the more. Right? We're living just merely for subsistence, just to survive. Now, some people survive a lot more uh, luxuriously than others, but even if you have all the money in the world, if you have not God, you are still living really on a day-to-day -day basis without meaning in life. But that's the sheep. Right? Here we see the coin, and the coin it is lost, and it is lost within the house, not in the wild. Okay? This coin that is lost, it is me, it is you, it is the Christians. Okay? So one difference between this parable and the previous is now Jesus is drawing the attention from looking at the whole world, and he is focusing now on those who are saved. Because now he's looking at these coins that are in the house, and this coin is lost in the house. It's not out in the wilderness. Okay? The coin, the coin, it has value and it has function, right? When you look at a coin, you look at what denomination it is. Is it a half dollar? Is it a dollar? I, I love those dollar coins that the VTA vending machines give you, but they're really impractical. They're heavy, right? But every coin, you look at it, you understand its value. You know that it's worth a dollar, 50 cents, 25 cents, 10, 5, 1 cent. Whatever it is, a coin has value and that coin has function. You can use it. Nowadays, these coins don't buy us a whole lot, right? We, we, we listen to stories like uh, Little House on the Prairie, where the dad and mom give the kids a penny. And with that penny, they can go down to the general store and buy an armload of candy. Nowadays, you see a penny. This happens in our house. You see a penny sitting on the ground. Nobody bothers to pick it up, even in your house, right? Now, the, the coin, it has function. You can use it to buy something. And let's just rewind ourselves, pretend we're back in the days when a penny actually was worth a lot, right? This coin has function so long as it is in your hand. If that coin is misplaced, if it is lost, does it still have value? Yes, it does. A penny is still a penny. It is still worth a penny. It still has value. But if it is lost, if it's hiding under your couch, it has lost its function because you, the master, the owner, can no longer use that coin, right? So we, as Christians, we are the coins. In God's eyes, we have value. In God's eyes, we also have function. We serve a purpose. We have value as man and woman. As mankind, Jesus valued us and he gave his life to save us. But we also have function and, you know, what is our function? When we look at the song that we just sang, the first verse we said, and I, hope, and I hope as we sing it, this was our prayer, right? We said, I want to consecrate my life, Lord. Take my life. I want to consecrate it to you. Take my moments and my days, right? Every minute. Let it be yours. Let my hands move for you. Let my feet be swift and beautiful to take me where you want me to be. Um, let my voice sing for you, my king. Let my lips be filled with messages for you. My silver and my gold, my intellect, I will not withhold any of it. I give it all to you, Lord, to use as you will. And lastly, my will, right? The, the hardest thing to give up, my will, my heart, my love, and my whole self. I give to you, right? And so when we look at ourselves, there, there is definitely function. 
right? There's many ways that God can use us. And many times when I, when I hear this, and even when I say this, um, I, I want to somehow explain for God what it means when he says he wants to use us. Because in today's society, when we hear this word used, it has a very negative connotation, right? When you say, oh, this person just uses me, it feels very negative. But this is not God's heart when he says, I desire to use you, okay? How does God desire to use us? I mean, did you know that he desires to use us? Right? There's, there's two ways in which God wants to use us, or two purposes. The first, he wants to use us to fulfill his will. He has a will that he wants to accomplish, and he wants to use us to fulfill that will. Just to give you an example to, to illustrate this, um, from the church's perspective, right, every Sunday morning, we come and there are things to do. Now, as a pastor, I want to serve everyone and I want to help them find their function, and so there are tasks that I assign because there are things that need to get done, right? The chair that you're sitting in, guess what? It wasn't there when, when we came in the morning. It, it was in those huge stacks in the back. Somebody, thank you, Peter, somebody comes every Sunday morning early at 9 a.m., brings the chairs down and sets them up. There's work that needs to be done, right? The signs that you see, those beautiful signs, somebody has to go and put them up, rain or shine. The, the worship, Usually I lead worship, but sometimes we have someone else helping with worship. That's also something that needs to be done. Serving the bread and cup, uh, reaching out to people, inviting people to church, spreading good news. All of these are things that God wants to do, right? And from a church perspective, these are all tasks. And it's very easy to say, for myself at least, I know Gail and I had a discussion, it's very easy for me to, to to think this way, where and this is my personality. This is the church, I am serving here as a pastor. I want everyone to feel welcome. I don't want to put a burden on everyone, so I'm gonna get here at 8.30 in the morning and set everything up so that at 9.30, 9.45, everybody comes and everything is done and ready and just come and enjoy yourselves and worship and enjoy hearing the word of the Lord. And, and Gail said, yeah, Go ahead, I'd like to see you try, right? You'll burn out so quick, you know? And, and it's true, on one hand, as, as one person, or I have Alice and my kids helping also, but even as a family, we, can't, we can do it ourselves, but it's not healthy to do it ourselves. And so things need to be done, we need help. And so we assign tasks so that things can be done. Even the offering, right? As you offer, you are taking part in supporting the ministry because we are not a church backed by a parent church. We are financially independent. And so even as you serve an offering, that is a way that you are fulfilling a function. Now, if you're not doing your part, if you're not doing your part, if, if there's something that can't be done and you're not doing it, this is the way I used to think. And, and some of you can, can testify to this. If you don't want to do your part, if you don't want to serve, if you don't want to contribute, well, God doesn't need you. Right? I used to be kind of mean. God doesn't need you. If you don't want to set up the chairs, he'll find someone else to do it. And in a sense, in a sense, that is still true. Theologically, biblically, it is true that God does not need any one of us. He can very well give that honor and that privilege to someone else to step in and serve and accomplish what he wants accomplished. But take it from the perspective of the body, we do need everyone, right? So God doesn't need any single person, but the body needs all the members because all members work together. And when one member is down and missing and hurt, we, we see this very clearly stated in the scriptures. When one member is not there, the whole body hurts. And so from the body's perspective, we need to have everyone on board, everyone serving, everyone doing what they can. Now that's for fulfilling a will or a purpose, right? From, from a more, um, is it macro? From a more micro perspective, we as a church, there are tasks to be done. From God's perspective, there are lots of souls that he wants to save, and he wants each and every one of us to participate in some way, right? But from the other perspective, God also wants to use us, not only to fulfill his will, but for each and every one of us to 
fulfill our purpose. From the perspective of the church again, I do ask as many people as I can, as many tasks as we have, I ask people to serve, to help out somehow. Why? Because I remember when I was first asked to serve in church back in high school, and I remember to this day what an honor, what a privilege it was when the pastor asked, can you serve to teach Vacation Bible School this year? I remember what an honor, what a privilege it was when the worship leader came and asked me, can you serve on the worship team? We need a bassist. Now, I had ulterior motives. My parents said, if you play bass for the church, we'll buy you a bass. And so I said, bring it up, right? But, but underneath all that, there was an undercurrent of, I got to serve. I, I'm some, they actually asked me to serve in church. My goodness, I didn't think I was good enough. And I'm not good enough. But somebody along the way decided to give me a chance, to give me, a, a, to take a risk, if you will. Because, you know, I, I grew up listening to a lot of heavy metal music, right? Who knows if the bass is gonna be on a stage rocking up. But anyways, so somebody took a risk and said, Jason, come and serve in a church. And I was able to fulfill a purpose. I was able to find a use for myself in the house of God. And I, I'm gonna misquote Kennedy, but it, it's uh, ask not what your church can do for you, but what you can do for your church, right? If, if we always think about what I can get, what I can get when I come to church, you'll be fed, you will be fed, but you won't be able to step into that function that God desired for you. Again, not because he's using you, but because he wants you to grow in your service. He wants you to bloom into maturity, right? When you serve in the body, and I hope this isn't discouraging anyone, when you serve in the body, you will grow because people are difficult to work with. So if nothing else, you will learn how to love your brother and sister. It's easy to love your brother and sister when you see them once a week on Sunday, you come in, you say hi, you eat your donuts and bagels, you shake hands, you sing together, you go home. When you serve together, when st different opinions start to come up, when you start to have conflicts, that's when you really learn to exercise brotherly love, as the Bible teaches us. And God, in having you serve in his house or out there in the world, he's teaching you and he's helping you to grow. Preaching the gospel. It would be easy, it would be so easy if we just had a list of steps that we do to preach the gospel. And Alice and I are actually speaking at a workshop next Saturday at another church's retreat to talk about what it takes to preach the gospel. And it's not just four rules that you follow and you ask someone to recite it and you're done. Preaching the gospel is a very personal thing that you do and it's different from person to person. It's different depending on the person who's sharing the good news and it's different depending on the person who's receiving it. As you are put to use in preaching the gospel, you are forced to grow because guess what? You're going to find all of a sudden as you're sharing God's good news with someone that maybe you know the doctrine of the good news but you don't quite have that relationship with Jesus, and so you're able to tell the story, but you're not able to put life into it. And so it, it challenges you to re-examine your relationship with Jesus, and you need to take a step back. And so when we serve, when we are put to use, God is doing something in us, right? I mentioned that when, when we serve, um, you know, in terms of setting up in the mornings, I ask my kids to help. Right? I don't know if any of you saw the sign out on the road as you drove in. That sign, I have, a, I have a sign to my son. I said, this is your task. You're going to take care of this every Sunday. Put the, the, the banner on the actual frame, tie it up, and carry it out there. You know what? I can do it. I could do it. There, there's time to do it. But in asking him, well, it, it is nice to have help. But in asking him, what I'm doing is I'm teaching him to have responsibility. I'm teaching him to really shoulder the burden with your dad, with the church. The, the nice spread that you saw when you came in, all the little, what were those creamers that are laid out nicely? Somebody put some effort into it, right? My daughter did that. And she has learned to take responsibility. You know what? Yes, we can do it ourselves, but as we assign people to do work, they grow, they learn, right? And that's what God has in 
store for us. As we serve, we grow and we see a change, just like I'm seeing a change in my kids. So what happened then? Now we're gonna come back to the coin. We know that a coin has function just like we have function. So what happened to this one coin? It is lost and it is in darkness. How do we know this? We're still on verse eight, bear with me. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, what does she do? Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Again, like I said before, coins that are misplaced have lost their function. We have a lot of coins on top of our laundry machine. Coins that have made it through the wash or ended up in a dryer that we found in a, in a uh, lint catcher. And we take all the coins out and we just leave it on, on the laundry machine. It's sitting there, it's not useful because we haven't taken it and put it in our pockets and taken it with us, right? Or they've fallen uh, somewhere dark. Coins that are lost, again, have no more function. What does it mean? What does it mean for a Christian to lose his function? There was a time, there was a period of time last year when I felt almost completely abjectly useless. It was a very, very, I would say it was the roughest period in my life that I have faced. And I was, I was outwardly, outwardly I was able to go through the routines. I was able to perform my tasks. But inside, I felt like, I felt like a light had been extinguished. And so outwardly, I was going through the motions, doing the things I was supposed to do. But I had lost my function. My words didn't carry power. There was no life coming out of me because I was in that darkness, right? When we are in darkness, we lose our functionality. We can still do what people see outside. And many times we keep doing it because of social pressure. We are afraid that someone's going to look and say, oh, so-and-so is not coming to church anymore or not serving anymore, is there something wrong? And so for the sake of outward appearance, we keep doing what we think we're supposed to do, but the real function is gone. When, when your real function is gone, when you're in darkness, how do you preach the gospel? I, I really don't see how anybody can share God's love when you're in darkness. When, how can you think for others? When you're in darkness, all you can focus on is yourself. Right? And the, what, what does it mean to be in darkness? Right? You hear this a lot in churches. Right? You don't live in darkness, you know, don't be in darkness. What does it actually look like to be in darkness? It could be sin that you've committed. Right? As you commit sin, look at Moses. We look at Moses, he's one of the founding fathers of our faith. He's a great patriarch. He led, he led the nation of Israelites out of Egypt, right? He did some great things, but look at his early years. You know that he grew up as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. He grew up in royalty. And you remember as we read back on the account of Moses that one day he saw an Egyptian uh, slaving it or, or, you know, abusing his authority over his fellow, Egypt, uh, his fellow Israelite brothers. You all know the story. Moses saw the Egyptian and he came and he struck the Egyptian down. Right? And we read this and we gloss over it so easily. He sees an Egyptian picking on his brothers. He comes and he strikes him down. You know the Bible tells us Moses was a strong guy and he struck him down. Not just struck him down, he killed a man. Moses was a murderer, right? And so many times we look at Moses and we glorify him and we think he's such a great man. You know what? He was a mess, right? At the very basic level, not only did he commit murder, but if you dig down deeper, he had the sin of pride in him. He thought, I am going to do something with my own hands to help my people. And so in his pride for sin, he kills a man, he takes a life by his own prerogative, second sin. And when the next day the Israelites confronted him, remember, he's now, now these Israelites, now that they don't have this Egyptian slaving over them, they started picking on each other. And Moses comes and he says, I'm gonna save the day, I'm gonna come and you know, stop fighting. And the Israelites said, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna hit us and kill us too? And all of a sudden he realized what he had done. And remember, he fled. 
He fled into the wilderness for how long? 40 years, for 40 years he was out in the wilderness. He sinned and he, for those next 40 years, could not be the person that God intended him to be. He was in darkness, he lost his function, right? So it could be sin that keeps us from functioning the way we want to. It could be something that happened to you, not something that you did, but something external to you. Somebody said something to you and hurt your feelings, or somebody physically hurt you, whatever it is, you, you've been hurt, you've been offended, and you find that you're not able to get past it. You're stuck on it and you dwell on it, and so you can't move. It could be a disappointment in life. You're looking at your life and it's not going the way you wanted it to be. You're not at the job you thought you would be at, or you're not even employed. You, you're not married to the person you want to be married to. She, she was dumb and she went and married someone else, not as good as you. Whatever it is, you're disappointed. And you're looking at your life and you're thinking, how did I get here? And so you're stuck in that. Or it, it could be any number of reasons, any number of things, but you find yourself in darkness. And so your function is in, in God's eyes, your usefulness diminishes or perhaps is completely gone. And sometimes you don't realize it. Like I said, sometimes just because we're so used to going through the motions, going through the routines, we're able to keep on carrying them, keep on keeping them. But the light inside has been extinguished. And so how do we come out of that darkness? We're still in verse eight. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? This woman represents the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to bring revelation, which is why she lights that lamp to cast out the darkness so that the coin can be found. When we are in darkness, my brothers and sisters, when we are in darkness, we desperately, desperately need the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because when you're in darkness, many times you don't know that you're in darkness. It's like if you're drowning and you don't know you're drowning. At least when you're drowning, you're flailing, you're trying to gasp for breath and you know you're in trouble. But when you're in darkness, many times you don't even know that you're in darkness. And this is why we need the work of the Spirit to come into our lives to shine, right? Well, what, is it, what does it mean? I mean, again, I'm stopping a lot to look at these phrases that we hear a lot in church sermons, right? The Holy Spirit works, shines light on us. What does that mean, right? You pray and all of a sudden, bing, bing. it's not a physical light. It is not a physical light that goes on. It is, it is a revelation. You know, like I was saying, last year I was in a really rough spot and I didn't realize it, but I was in darkness. And God started to speak to me. We, we had gone out to New York to, to attend a pilgrim camp out east in upstate New York. And I spent that week and a half, two weeks in prayer before the Lord about something else. But along the way, God did not answer that prayer. He dealt with other issues that, I, that needed to be dealt with first, right? One night, through the sermon and through a vision I saw in my dream, he dealt very much with the anger that I had in my heart. That is the Holy Spirit shining a light in you, bringing to the surface something that you didn't even realize that you're dealing with, a darkness that you didn't even know was in your life. And I remember night after night at the camp, as I prayed, as I sought the Lord, I was praying saying, God, I need answers for this question, and he kept on not answering me. Why? Because there were so many other things. And so night after night, like an onion, layer by layer, he peeled it back. He said, Jason, this issue you need to deal with. And so that night, I dealt with it before the Lord. Good. The next night, I prayed, okay, God, I need an answer. No, Jason, here's a second. And so one after the other, after the other, the Holy Spirit worked and revealed and said, this is what's wrong with you. This is what's wrong with you. This is what you need to repent. This is where you need to come clean before the Lord. That is the light that shines in us, that brings us out of darkness by showing us that we are in darkness. You know, sometimes, sometimes we're, we're in sin and we're doing something that's wrong and we don't know it or we know it, but we're choosing to ignore it. 
The Holy Spirit, if you ask the Holy Spirit to work, the Holy Spirit will show you what you're doing wrong. Sometimes we're just in too much hurt and we can't come out of it. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. The Holy Spirit comes in and brings healing to your soul and brings you past that hurt and gives you the ability to let go of whatever it is that someone else has done and sometimes opens your eyes to see, you know what, you're at fault also, right? This is the work of the Spirit. Sometimes the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is, is very specific. And it is very specific to every individual. And God knows. God knows where you are at. God knows the condition of your heart. God knows if you're in darkness. And He knows specifically what it is you need to hear. And so going back to the camp, the last night, the last night before we left. And, you know, maybe God timed me this way. Yes, I think He timed me this way. The last night before we left, the last message that we heard, spoke very specifically and answered my prayer. It was the account of Samuel, the prophet, who was in the dumps because Saul had been, from God's eyes, removed as king. He was still in a position of the king, but God has said he will no longer be king, right? And in 1 Samuel 15, 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. That night, the Lord spoke so clearly to me. First, he said, stop feeling sorry for yourself, Jason. Okay. Wow, really? You're going to go there, God? Don't you know how much there is? To stop feeling sorry for yourself. How long are you going to spend mourning? Stop it. There is work that needs to be done. Take your horn, fill it with oil, and go, right? And so that night, the Holy Spirit, through God's word, spoke and said, now we're done. Now we're done dealing with your issues. Now we're done. This is the answer. Go. You are going to do this work. And now we're here at Porch Light, right? I don't know if there's anyone here this morning that feels like they are in darkness. I don't know if there's anyone that feels like they wish they could serve a purpose or function, but they couldn't. For whatever reason it is, you feel stuck or you feel like you are unable, know that the Holy Spirit is willing to work in your life. Know that the Holy Spirit wants to come in and shine a light to reveal in you what it is, what darkness it is that has got a hold of you. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you what bondage that you are stuck under, what, what wiles of the enemy are suffocating you that's keeping you from breathing in and breathing out the Spirit that you're not even aware of. And so I was wondering if we can just bow our heads. Let me bow our heads. And I would like to pray for us this morning. All right? Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Don't look around. I, I want you to come before God this morning. Come before God this morning and really... If you want to consecrate your life, right? If you want to consecrate your life, if you want to really sing out this song that we sang this morning with all your heart to say, Lord, I want to consecrate my life. Lord, take my moments and my days. Let my hands move for you. Let my feet move for you. Let my voice sing for you and my lips be filled with your messages. I don't want to hold back anything. But if you find yourself unable, this would be the time to come before the Lord and to say, Lord, I need help. And so as you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I would like to pray for us. And as we pray, open yourself to the Lord. Open yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal what it is in you, what darkness there is that you are stuck in that you need to be free of. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are the good shepherd and that you pay the ultimate cost to go out into the wilderness, to come into the world, to find us and to save us. But I also thank you, Lord, that your salvation does not stop there, but that you have sent the Holy Spirit into our midst to lead us and to guide us. And where necessary, Lord, to shine 
your light in our lives and to reveal to us, Lord, those dark corners that we have been hiding from you and from ourselves. And so this morning, I pray for each brother and sister here as they bring themselves before you, Lord, as they open their hearts to you to be examined. Jesus, I pray that your spirit would work in our midst, that your spirit would speak, Lord, that your spirit would leave no stone unturned, but that you would come and touch each and every one of us, Lord. Jesus, this morning, show us Show us the darkness that has a hold over us. Show us the darkness that has blinded us. And help us, Lord, because you know we need help. You know that we cannot come out of this darkness on our own. Help us this morning, Lord, and speak to us. Lord, we cannot do this on our own, and we need the work of the Spirit, and so come this morning, Lord, and work in our midst. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was wondering if, before we go into the Lord's Supper, if we can sing that song, Take My Life Again. And as you sing it, as you sing it, in, in each verse, there is something that is to be given to the Lord. As you sing it, Reflect on perhaps if, if there is something that is holding you back from that particular category. If the Lord wants you to do something with your hands and you're not willing. If the Lord wants you to speak your lips, a message for him to someone and you are not able. If the Lord wants you to take your silver and gold and give it to him and you cannot. If the Lord wants your will and you find yourself unable to budge. As we sing this song. Make it a prayer and examine each aspect of yourself and say, Lord, I need you to free me from this part. Take 